Ooh, I'm glad I got the power. How about you? I'm glad you're here today. Thank you for being with us. We're in this series, I've Got the Power. If you missed the other couple of weeks, you need to go back, three weeks, I guess, go back and listen to those teachings in our archive. I think they will help you because we all know that the world we're living in today, we need more of the power of God in our life. We're in a time of transition right now, you know, uh, People are off summer vacation, kids are going back to school, uh, life is trying to get back, and then COVID comes in, there's another transition, we're trying to do all those things, and we really need to seek God, don't you believe? Every year in January and then in August, the Father's House sets aside time to really go after God, seek God in fasting and in prayer. In January, we do 21 days of fasting and prayer, and sometimes in August, we've done 21 days, we've done seven days, 10 days, but this year, we're doing a three-day breakthrough fast, and if you don't have the brochure, we have a brochure out in the uh, foyer for you that says three-day TFH breakthrough fast, and I hope that you will be part of that. We start tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then also, every morning on the Father's House Facebook page at 6 a.m., I'm going to be leading us in some prayer and talking about what God is doing, and then at 8 p.m. at night. So 6 a.m. and 8 p.m., join us on the Father's House uh, Facebook page, and we'll be talking about that. Now listen, if you have medical reasons and you uh, are worried about fasting, check with your doctor. Maybe you can't do. Some people, a lot of people are going to do water only or liquid only for three days. And uh, some of you are saying, you know, well, I'm going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give up uh, asparagus for three days. Uh, let's give up something that means something to us, all right? So make a difference. So we're going to be doing that. And so uh, also, we're going to be praying during the time of fasting. And so uh, the, also the fast thing is on our, web, on our website, thefathershouse.com. And also, or is it on Facebook Live? Or is Facebook somewhere? Okay, good. It's, I, I knew it would. They're always one step ahead of me. But one thing that we've really, a lot of us have just recently got, if you go to the app store, there's an app called Pray First. It really is the book that we give away for about prayer, but it really deals with taking prayer to another level, and especially in this time. And so let me give you a little inter, uh, introduction of what this uh, app is all about. Here it is. It's called Pray First. Pray First is a focused prayer experience in both English and Spanish that allows you to follow along with different models of prayer. It includes prayer guides, special songs written specifically for the prayer experience, and resources to help anyone learn more about prayer and fasting. While there is no art to prayer, it's simply talking with God. There are some ways we can pray that can help us better connect from the natural to the supernatural. We hope that this app will help you, your family, and your friends to pray with more faith, more intention, and more frequency. And it's our prayer that this app would be a blessing to you. It's available today, totally free, on your app store or at PrayFirstApp.com. Yeah, it's a great one. Our staff uses that. I've got it on my phone. I'm using that. And uh, so we want to pray more. Let's pray now. That'd be a novel idea. Father, we thank you as we approach opening your word. Lord, this is uh, such a serious time to open your word in such an important subject about the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. And it's been a subject that's been... Uh, misaligned, it's been misinterpreted, it's been abused. And so, Lord, we've just been very cautious as we come. I ask people to give us a blank page, try to get beyond what we thought we learned from a different church, and just look at what the Scripture says. So today, Lord, I know, I know how much that we need this teaching. I saw the response in the first service of all those that came down for prayer, for their spiritual prayer language. We sense your spirit, your power. So, Lord, I just pray you would anoint me. These words are nothing without you, and we also need your anointing that we could grasp and understand all that you have for us in your name. Amen. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. These are the last words of Jesus as he's ascending into heaven. He's uh, there on the Mount of Olives, 
And sometimes when you see the picture of Jerusalem, you'll see the gold dome. That's right near where the Mount of Olives, where Jesus ascended, and where his feet will come back down the next time that he comes. In fact, if you'd like to go there and see it for yourself, you should go with us next December, December 2022, to our Holy Land experience. We'll be having an uh, information meeting soon in October, November, so you can ask the questions that you have. But get the brochure outside, and it'll answer those questions for you. Guess what? 125 sleeps, Michael, until Christmas. A hundred and, yeah, isn't that exciting? Casey, don't you like that? Yeah, Tim and I, we love Christmas. 125 sleeps. Some of you are saying, oh, no, no. I, I love, I, I'm a gift giver, and I'm a, I, giving and gifts are my love language, and I love those. When I had children that were smaller and grandchildren that were smaller, I would just go to craziness, getting gifts for them, wrapping them up and being excited. We'd do games like, here's your first gift, and in there, the gift, now take another break, go outside and look under the lawnmower, and there would be a, cute, a hint out there, and then they'd go over here and somebody else, and I just love giving gifts, and you know, I, it, now the kids are all older, and they say, Poppy, just give us money. We're on a different wavelength now. Just give us money. And so, bummer, it takes all the fun out of it. So I have to lavish all that giving off to, off to Anita right now. And I get her the special gifts. But I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking about, it would really be terrible if I would have given one of those gifts to my grandchildren or my children, and they'd look at the gift and they'd say, ah, I don't want it, and just toss it aside. Or just say, ah, we'll look at it later and put it under the tree. Wouldn't that be a horrible thing? Jesus has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people say, well, I'm not sure I want to unwrap that because, you know, I'm not sure what all that comes with that. And so they just push it aside or they don't do that. I mean, what would it, does it look like to God when people laugh or mock or cast aside the gifts that he has? Uh, Ephesians 4 and 30 says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. How do I grieve the Holy Spirit of God? I would grieve the Holy Spirit of God when I wouldn't pay attention to the Holy Spirit and the, and the impact that he's supposed to have in my life. Let me encourage a great book that you might want to read by Jack Hayford. Jack Hayford. The book is called The Beauty of Spiritual Language. The Beauty of Spiritual Language. It's just been recently expanded and updated. I got my new version, and it's really one of the best books because what, what, what he will do, he alleviates a lot of confusion that I don't have time to deal with all that this morning. The confusion in the difference in what he calls the gift of a prayer language or speaking in tongues and the grace of that. In other words, a gift would be used in a public setting like this, just as a gift of knowledge, a word of wisdom, and all the others. But the, the, the grace of that would be private in my private prayer language, and I pray. So today, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about praying and praising in our spiritual language. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 and 39, do not forbid to speak in tongues. Some of you come from a church background in which that was forbidden, and, or it was just ignored. But the Scripture says clearly, don't forbid, don't stop. It doesn't mean that there won't be order in how we do that. So let me, let me begin today. Look. We have these little connection cards in the back of the seat, and if you're a first-time guest, please fill this out, because if we don't have your information, we don't know how to invite you to a very special Meet the Pastor meeting that we're going to be having very soon. And if you're not invited, that means we don't have your information, and, if we have no, and that means if you're a new person, all right? So I, I don't want people thinking, I've been coming for 15 years, and I'm going to go to that. No, it's for new people, okay? I'm going to, Tanya, I'm sorry, I probably got in over my head right there, but anyway, fill out that information. But I was going to say this too. If you have any questions about the Holy Spirit, 
Just write them on the back. We're going to do our best in uh, this month and next month to cover as many of those things as we can. And then my friend Steve Kelly is coming in Labor Day weekend, and uh, he's, a, he's just a master of, of anything to do with the Holy Spirit, and he'll be speaking and releasing really an apostolic anointing over us in that area. So today I'm going to answer some questions that have been given that people have, and I just want to, I'm going to buzz through these fairly quick. And uh, some of the books that I've given you will help you with that, some of the ones that we've talked about. Number one, do we have good biblical reasons to believe the gifts of the Holy Spirit are still valid for today? Uh, and the reason I say that is because a lot of the churches that you came from, you were told that the gifts of the Spirit and, and the Holy Spirit, the prayer language, ceased with the death of the apostles. In theology, we have two different groups that about the spiritual gifts. One is a group that's called the cessationist. There in your notes, the cessationists believe that signs and wonders and spiritual gifts are no longer valid today, that they have ceased. That 393, when the scripture was canonized, that spiritual gifts ceased. But I think you know, as well as I know, the Holy Spirit still moves, he still speaks, and he's still available. There's a second group in theology that are called the continuationists. And the continuationists believe that the spiritual gift have always been present in the church, and they are continuing today and all through the church age. Now, I know some of you are, are scholars, and you say, I'd just like to know a little bit more about that. Well, look in your handout there, and it says spiritual gifts in church history, and it gives you a website to go through, www.samstorms.org org, enjoying God blog post spiritual gifts in church history. Now what he does, he's a master at this. He's a master. He's, a, he's one of the greatest theologians that are around. He's gone back into history, into, into those areas that you don't read a lot about, and he he's, gives documentation of gifts of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit working in the church age, and so I encourage you to do that. So we believe here at the Father's house, we are continuous. We believe that the gifts of the Spirit and prayer language, uh, Holy Spirit still going today. How many of you would agree with that? Amen. Second question, what was speaking in tongues at Pentecost, Acts 2, the supernatural ability to utter real human languages not previously known or studied by the speaker. In my opinion, yes, because it's very clear. Here's what the scripture says in Acts 2, 5 and 8. These people who uh, heard the disciples and the others in the upper room uh, speaking in languages at that particular time, they were known languages of men. Because it says, and there in dwelling at Jerusalem were devout men from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused. Because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language as we were born? On that particular time, yes, in Acts 2, the language that was spoke was the language of men. It's the same thing that happens on many mission fields today. Some of the missionaries, even of uh, cessationist denominations, the missionaries have this special gift of the Holy Spirit at times in a crunch to be able to speak in a dialect or a language that they've never studied before. But that's not the only thing about the Holy Spirit. Question three is, are tongues evangelistic? Are they evangelistic? And the reason that I ask that question or people ask that question is because of the some people who believe in the ceasing of the gifts will say, well, speaking in tongues is only used as an evangelistic tool because on the day of Pentecost, they heard them speak in their own language, and they 3,000 were added to the church. But that's not accurate. No evidence that the tongues in Acts 2 or elsewhere in the book of Acts served for an evangelistic purpose. And many of you have been taught that. The Holy Spirit power is to give you power that you can be an evangelist, that you can evangelize, you can win people to the Lord. 
Well, the Holy Spirit gives us power to live, and we're supposed to be sharing the gospel, so he helps us that. But don't think in a narrow-minded way the Holy Spirit comes upon you only to help you to be a more effective witness. Because, listen, in Acts 2, verse 11, they said, we heard them speak, listen to what they heard them speak, the wonderful works of God. We didn't hear them speak and teach us about you need to repent and give your heart. We heard them talk as a doxology about the wonderful works of God. Acts 10, Acts 19, Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 19. All of those areas, they heard them speak. They heard them speak in tongues of worshiping and saying how God, how great God is. So, are tongues just for an evangelistic? No. They are, uh, the tongues that you hear people speak is magnifying, worshiping God, and praising God. Number four, are tongues always human languages? Well, if it was human languages in Acts chapter 2, then does that mean that all speaking in tongues is human languages? Well, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 10, Paul describes what's called kinds or species, genoglossan in the Greek. He says, to another, the working of miracles. These are gifts of the Spirit. To another, the working of prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, look at this, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Paul suggests here that there are different categories of speaking in tongues. There's a category of speaking in human languages that might be used as a missionary. Or I was at a church once years ago in Ohio, and we were praying. I was ministering to someone, and I was, I was praying for that person in, in, in my prayer language. I was just praying for them because I didn't know how to pray. And the woman, her eyes opened wide, and she said, wait. She said, I didn't know that you spoke Italian. I said, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> no, I didn't. I said, what do you mean? She said, I'm Italian. And she said, you just spoke with perfect Italian, even with the accent. And she said, you were talking to me about how great God is. Wow. Beyond my pay grade, but it's not only speaking in human languages, but it's also heavenly, angelic languages. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 and 2, whenever I speak in tongues, I'm not speaking to men, but to God. So, if all tongue speaking was to be human languages, Paul is not accurate. Because if it was human languages, it'd be the language of men. And Paul said, no, I'm speaking, I'm speaking to God. He said in 1 Corinthians 13 and 1, he refers to the tongues of men and of angels. Now, why that might be a hyperbole, he's really referring to here, I believe, heavenly or angelic dialects or dialect that the Holy Spirit purposely gives you in your prayer language. Question number five. How does Paul, what does Paul say is the purpose of speaking in tongues? What is the purpose of speaking in tongues? Paul says the purpose of speaking in tongues is very simply. It's prayer and praise. He says in 1 Corinthians 14 and 2, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 15. For if I pray in a tongue, if I'm praying in my spiritual prayer language, my spirit prays, and my understanding is unfruitful. So what is the conclusion then? Well, I'm going to pray with the Spirit, even though I don't understand what I'm saying, and I also pray with understanding in my native language. And he says, not only that, but I'm going to sing with the Spirit, and I'm going to sing with understanding. He said, I'm going to do both of those. He said, I will. So evidently, Paul's religious life was regularly giving to praying, singing, and praising God in a heavenly language. In a heavenly language. That gives me goosebumps. That makes me want. That makes me want to see that more and more in my life and in your life. So 
what is the purpose, what does Paul say is the purpose of our prayer language, the heavenly language, speaking in tongues? First of all, there in the fill-ins, it's a means of communicating with God in prayer and praise. It's a means of communicating with God in prayer and praise. I think there's even been a misnomer or a, vis, a, a, a mislinguistic use of words in a lot of the Pentecostal denominations when they'll say, in a church service, someone has given out a message in tongues. I'm not sure that that really is accurate to say that it's a message in tongues, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later. But it's, uh, it's, it's giving prayer and praise to God. Second of all, speaking in tongues is a means for building yourself up or edifying yourself. He says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. He says, I want you to build yourself up. Man, I don't know about you, but when you, I don't watch the news. I've given up watching the news. If I do, I might watch a little Newsmax. I don't watch Fox. I don't watch CNN. I don't watch NBC, ABC. They all lie. Newsmax probably lies too. But right now, they seem to be a happy medium in the midst of that. But if I'm watching it, I'm going to only watch it to get the headlines of what's going on because I don't trust any of them. I don't believe any of them. And if I sit there for 15 minutes, I'm like this. I want to kill myself. I want to give up. What's the use? I hate the world. The world hates me. And, and, then, and then not only that, but some of you that are business owners, you've been talking to me this week. You said, I hired three people, and they didn't show up this week. I need workers, and they don't show up. Up in Blue Ridge, where we have our cabin, we go up there, and, there's a, and there's, I ordered a pizza, and the guy came on and said, this is a recorded message. If you're trying to order a pizza, then that means probably some of our workers didn't show up, and I don't have anybody to make them, so forget about it. I can't make you a pizza. That's the world we're living in today. That's the world we're living in. And doesn't it just sap the energy out of you? I mean, just last week I got prayer requests after prayer requests after prayer requests after prayer requests, and there were tough things. It was this and this and this and this. And I'm thinking, oh, man, I, I just, I don't know. Let's just, let's just run away. Let's just go to an island, and let's forget about eating healthy, and let's get long robes, and we can just get fat underneath those long robes and forget about the world. I said, I should be a Samoan, you know? But we can't do that, can we? So what do we do? I get alone with the Lord, and I begin releasing my prayer language. And the Holy Spirit begins coming, and the Holy Spirit begins to encourage me and build me up, like between 5 and 5.30 this morning when the Lord said, just build yourself up. And so I'm just building myself up in, the, in, 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 in my prayer language. How many of you, by raising your hands, have ever experienced that? And you know what that's like. Would you give the Lord a praise right now and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I can be down and out. I can be ready to give up and quit. And I get alone with the Lord in my prayer closet. And I begin praying in my prayer language. And he begins to build me up. And I begin to feel a little tingling. I begin to feel, and sometimes I don't feel anything. So don't ever judge by your ability to pray in the Spirit by your feelings. You'll not always get up. You'll not always have tears. But you'll be tapped in to something that will build you up in your faith. Praying in tongues is also an effective instrument in spiritual warfare. In Ephesians 6 and 18, Paul tells us that we should pray in the Spirit, in pneumata, in pneumata. He said, I want you to pray. We're not limited just in English, but we can pray in our spiritual prayer language. Why? Because speaking in tongues is a way of compensating for our weakness and ignorance in praying for others. That's the very next filling there in your notes. Romans 8, 26 says, for in a similar, similar way, the Holy Spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty to empower us in our weakness. For example, at times we don't even know how to pray or know the best things to ask for. But the Holy Spirit rises up within us to super intercede on our behalf, pleading to God with emotional sighs too deep for words. God, the searcher of the heart, knows fully our longings, yet he also understands the desires of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit, look at this, passionately pleads before God for us. 
his holy ones, in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. I say to somebody sometime, you know, just this week, those requests coming in, boom, 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 boom. And I just, I just, I said, oh, that's a prayer in the spirit right there. Oh, it's, just, it's that groaning. And then you know what? When I get off the phone, I say, okay, Lord, I don't know how to pray for that. Holy Spirit, please help me. You know what's, what's the answer here? You know what's the answer here? And I could begin to pray in my spiritual prayer language, and I know that the Holy Spirit in me is interceding in that because he knows what is the heart and the mind of God. Question number six. Are tongues to be used in one's private devotional prayer life? Well, according to Paul, that's, a per, that's the predominant way that he exercised this gift. He said in 1 Corinthians 14, 18 and 19, is that on the screen? All right, read it with me. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. He was a southern, you know. <laughs> Y'all, I speak more than you all. And in that passage, he says, yet in church, in like Sunday morning like this, I would rather speak five words with clarity or five words in English that you can understand that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. So when people read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, they don't understand. They get confused that there's two types of things there. There's the, there is the public exercise gift of tongues, and if it's done in church or a small group, it should come with an interpretation so that it edifies the body of Christ. But in my personal prayer time, <laughs> I don't look to just pray there. I'm praying in that private prayer language. Paul said 1 Corinthians 14 and 28, if there's no interpreter in the church, let a person keep silence. You don't just speak out loud in tongues. He says, let him speak to himself and to God. What does that mean? That means that I'm very quietly, very quietly to myself, praying, interceding, and not trying to take over the church service, right? He says in 1 Corinthians 14 and 18, I like this, I like this. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. So if that's Paul, then why should we despise or fear this gift? I want to use the rest of our time right now to just talk about some practical ways in which that we receive our prayer language. So I'm going to invite Anita uh, to come with me and to share. She can balance out some of the things that I will say today uh, to help us. Uh, first of all, I want us to understand that there's really not a prescribed method or a procedure in the Bible for how we receive the gift of tongues, okay? So there's not really prescribed except to ask. He said, I want you to ask. Uh, I was raised in Pentecostal church. I mean, it's amazing that I'm still alive today. Uh, and some of you feel the same way. It's amazing, right? Uh, the abuses that we, we, we've seen, people yell out and scream out and and uh, in a time of being very quiet, you know, if everybody's vocal and it's everything going, I mean, there's, it's all right to yell out, praise God. But a lot of times, you know, it would be very quiet time. Prayer. Uh, people sometimes don't know how to deal with silence. That was really good, Jennifer. And by the way, congratulations to Jennifer Bryant. Yes. She, she is songwriter as well as a worship leader. And she released a song called Life in the party life in the party and you can so go to good. any of the social media and download that jennifer bryant it's the first of many that she is going to write so anyway jennifer thank you amen thank you a few minutes ago for the quiet time thank you andrew for the quiet time nobody talking nobody singing just some music now for some of us that come from a pentecostal background at times like that, we get a little nervous, like, we should say something. We should, you know, do something in, in the midst of all of that. But we just need to sit and wait on the Lord, don't we? And do things in order. So I was raised in a Pentecostal denomination, and by the time you were old enough to understand, your goal was that you needed to receive your prayer language and speak in tongues. It was more of the goal was to speak in tongues than to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you would go down. We have revivals back then. You go down and pray. 
snot and cried. And uh, here's sort of how it was. On one side, you have somebody saying, hold on. On the other side, you got somebody, let go. And then you have somebody say, say, glory, 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 fast. Glory, 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 faster. Glory, 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 faster. Glory, 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 faster. Glory, glory, glory. Somebody else saying, just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Faster, faster, faster. We don't teach that at the Father's house. We don't manipulate. However, see, you can't be dogmatic because I know people who've received their spiritual prayer language that very way. I just think they got tired of people yelling at them, and they just began to just release. Now, I was in the fifth grade, and I was so hungry. So hungry for this prayer language. I fasted all day in the fifth grade. Recess and different times, I put my head down on the desk and prayed, let it be tonight, Lord. I'm just hungry. I'm hungry. The invitation was given. I went down to the altar, and uh, before anybody could get there, tell me all the manipulation. I just found myself praising God in a language I'd never studied in the fifth grade. And uh, it wasn't brilliant. It wasn't like a, people say, well, you know, when I first spoke in tongues, it was like gibberish, like a, like a child's gibberish. You know what about child's gibberish? The child knows what they're saying. They're talking to you, and it sounds like gibberish to you. But they're saying, what's wrong with you? Don't you have the gift of interpretation? Don't you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so I'm saying sometimes when we first start, it may sound like baby. It may sound gibberish, maybe a few phrases. Now, you're the antithesis of that, right? Of you? Yes, of yes. my experience. Um, yes. So I was raised in the Catholic Church. Some of you know my story, but, um, you know, that was like never talked about. Or if it was, I never heard it, Okay. So um, I didn't get saved till I was 30 years old, and um, God started really blessing me with a lot of things, a new car, a new house, a new job. Um, I prayed to meet, if I was going to get married, that God would show me by my birthday. Then I met Pastor Terry. Just amazing, on amazing. On your birthday. On my birthday, yes. Um, amazing things. Um, but before we got married... I, you know, I used to I used to just do crazy stuff before I got saved. I used to just, you know, go to church on Saturday night so I didn't have to wake up on Sunday with a hangover. I mean, that's how bad it was. I only prayed when I needed something or I lost something. So I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. So I got saved. So before we got married and I moved in with my sister, um, you were doing a youth conference or something, and I was there with you. And uh, at the end, he said, if you want to receive your prayer language, come to the front and we'll pray for you and lay hands on you. And all these little kids were coming up. And I think, I mean, it was little kids up to teenagers coming up to the line. And I was in the back of the room and I was paying attention and, and listening. And, and, the, and the, the spirit of God was just amazing. And the, you could feel the presence of the Lord, right? So not everybody received their prayer language, but a lot of, probably 90% of the kids received their prayer language right there in the line. And I was like, that is amazing. That is so awesome. And I thought, I want that. I want that. I don't know if I understand it, but I want that. Because for me, in my past, it was like, oh, no, that's the devil. He's going to yeah. take over your mind and just make you say crazy things. And uh, no. So while I was there, though, I wanted that. So I went into the line, and I went up to the front, and I got prayed for. And I did not receive my prayer language right at that moment. But I knew something happened, and I felt, I felt that God was doing something in me. So later on, uh, when I got home, and I was just by myself in my room, and I was praising God, I was, I was thinking about all the amazing things God had done for me, how, how awesome he was, how much he loved me, what he took me out of, you know, just sitting there. And using my English words, I was thanking him and praising God. I put on a, a, a praise music, and before I knew it, I came to the end of the words that I could say. I didn't know what else to say. Like, how else can I praise God? And I was just sitting there, and I was remembering those kids. And all of a sudden, some language started. You know, I started praising God, but I realized I don't know how else to do this. So I, I moved my mouth, and out came some sounds. And at first, I was like, oh. 
I did that when I was a kid. I pretended to know another language when I was a kid. So I'm just faking. I'm just making that up. And you know what? All these years, that happens, still happens to me. Yeah. There are times when I'm praying in my prayer language, and then my thought, well, can, you're just making this up. Yeah. It's not real. Because the it's devil wants to lie to you and tell yeah. what, who, why would he want you to have the power <laughs> yeah. to build yourself up in your yeah. faith and to have the Holy Spirit In fact, you. I just thought about this. If it was of the devil, he'd probably say, yeah, go ahead, do right? more of that, do right? It. Uh, Whoa, that's yeah. good. That's good there. That's so, revelation. <laughs> so, I kept, so I kept praying in the Spirit, and at first it was odd because I wasn't used to hearing that come out of me. And I was like, okay. But the more I did it, the more I got used to it. Before I knew it, two hours went by where I was by myself in that room praying in the Spirit for two hours, heard different wow. kind of dialects wow. and everything. And I was, talk about being belt, built up. Talk about storm in hell with a water pistol. I was like, let's go. I am ready. I was so connected and, and just edified by doing that. Um, it was amazing. It was amazing. And I asked God, well, because I'm that person, I'm like, well, what did I say? <laughs> Come on, God, what was I saying? And he was like, he didn't give me an interpretation, obviously, for two hours of everything. But generally, I felt like God said, that was you and me. To get. You were praising. You were praying. You were thanking me. You were just lifting up, you know, uh, uh, adoration unto me. And so that was so cool. But the thing about it was, I had to, for lack of a better word, practice allowing myself to hear myself and continue to pray in the spirit. Because just like anything else, like a muscle, you don't use it, it kind of gets uh, weak, right? Yeah. So I would have to purpose in pray in my prayer language. And, um, you know, it, it, it's just amazing. And you... the. The prayer, the language doesn't overtake you. It's not like, right. oh my gosh, I have no, I have no right. control. Right. What am I going to do? What if it just happens in the middle of nowhere? It's not going to happen in the middle of nowhere. It's just like words don't come out of my mouth unless I start speaking. It's yeah. the same. It's the same thing. The spirit is subject to the person, yeah. so I can ask and I can um, uh, know when Holy Spirit wants me to use my prayer language to pray, um, you know, yeah. and to and to yeah. use it that way. There's a lot more stuff we can talk about, but I think we're going to pray. The, the thing that, that Paul said, he said, I will. That's what we have to understand. I will. I will release this prayer language. I will pray in my regular language. In the last service, we probably had, I don't know what, maybe a dozen people come down, Tim, and we laid hands on them. The pastors did. We're going to do that again in this service. Because I know there may be some of you who say, you know what, it's been years since I've received my prayer language and I've kind of let it be dormant. Between services, Jimmy had a very good observation. He said, you know, when, when I received my prayer language, it was a very small, but I had to set aside time, and that's time in worship for, sure. for that to happen. So today, in just a minute, I'll ask the pastors to come. And we're going to lay hands on you. In the book of Acts, Peter's preaching and the Holy Spirit came upon them. Nobody laid hands on them. Uh, the scripture doesn't say that I have to do that. Uh, Jesus said, if you ask your father for the Holy Spirit, he'll send the Holy Spirit. He won't give you a fake. He won't give you a fake. And then at other times in the book of Acts, it says they laid hands on them. And when they laid hands on them, they received their prayer language. Now, what will happen today when we lay hands on you? We're not going to push you down. We're not going to make you say banana backwards. We're not going to do any of those things. We're just going to pray scripturally. I just lay hands on you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I pray that Jesus would fill you, baptize you in the Holy Spirit with the beauty of your spiritual language. In the last service... Several people I prayed for, they said, what was that? I said, what? I just felt like, just like power, or I just felt like I was just going to pass out. And, and it's the Holy Spirit. Now, what will happen is, you might receive your prayer language in here, but probably for the most people, 
you'll go home, spend some quiet time with God, and he's just hungry for him. He'll just release, I will. And at first it may be very small, but then it'll increase and increase and increase. I've been doing this so, for so long that my dialects and my language will change. I know when I'm worshiping the Lord, and I know when I'm doing battle, praying against principalities and powers. Yeah. It's just a difference, just yeah. a difference. Yeah. It's not that a person that speaks in tongue is more holy or more mature than anybody else. The church is not haves and have-nots. Not everyone will speak in a language, but I believe everyone has the ability to do that if they would choose. Somebody asked me today in a text, are you at the Father's house? Are you, are you, are you going to, like, do we make everybody to pray out loud in front of people so that we can judge that they've received the Holy Spirit? I said, no, we'll never do that. That's between you and the Lord. Because it's one of the most beautiful things that you'll ever experience. Not to be afraid. So, before the pastors come, I just want to ask if you're here today and you've never invited Jesus into your heart and into your life. I was kind of shocked this week by a doctor friend of mine who went in the hospital and COVID and died a couple of days ago. Not very old, fairly young. Did a lot to help me in my life. And I thought, time is short, Lord. We got a lot to do to help people. And maybe you're here today and you've never invited Jesus into your heart and into your life. And you say, wow, Terry, you're talking so much about the Holy Spirit today. You know, what, what, what's my step? Well, the Holy Spirit convicts us and draws us to Jesus. So your first step would be to invite Jesus into your heart and into your life. But do you know at the very time that you invite Jesus into your heart and your life, he can also baptize you in or with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it can happen just that, it can happen just that quick, that quick. But I'd like for everyone to bow their heads right now and first of all, I'd like to pray for anyone today that would say, you know what, I'm not ready to meet the Lord. I'm not ready to meet Him. I'm not living my life for Him. Or maybe years ago you served Him, but right now you're far from Him. But you say today, Terry, I know that I need to invite Jesus in. I need him to forgive me of my sins. I don't like the way that I'm living. I don't like what's going on. I've tried to change, but I don't know how to change. Jesus saw that you'd be in that predicament, and he left the comforts of heaven. He came to this world, took your sins and my sins, and died on the cross that we could be forgiven of our sins and have meaning for life. Then on the third day, he rose. He rose to give us hope. So if you're here today, right where you're sitting, you say, Terry, would you include me in that prayer? Would you include me in that prayer? I want to surrender my heart to Jesus. Would you just raise your hand and make eye contact with me right where you are and say, yeah, that's me. I need to pray that prayer today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Others today, thank you. Others today, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Others today, thank you for being honest. Just lift your hands. No embarrassment. Thank you. Thank you today. I want to be sure my eternity is settled. I want to be sure that my eternity is settled and my sins are forgiven me. Maybe you've gone to church all of your life, but you've never prayed this prayer. Would you please allow me the privilege of leading you in prayer today for your eternities to change? Any others this morning? Those of you watching online, just lift your hand right where you are. Church, would you pray this prayer with me? Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. And I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Fill me with your spirit as best as I know how all the days of my life I'm going to serve you 
in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask the pastors and those that I've asked to come, to come on down front and get ready. And uh, those of you that prayed that prayer just a minute ago to invite Jesus into your heart and into your life, would you go out to take your connection card and go out to the next steps table? Now here's what we're going to do. In just a minute, if you say, you know what? I would like to have hands laid on me today because I really would like this spiritual prayer language. I, uh, or maybe it's been years since it happened and I'd, I'd like to see that rekindled. We're not going to embarrass you. I, I, we're not going to push you over. We're not going to do any of those things. We're just going to administer in the best way that we know how to lay hands on you and allow Jesus and believe that Jesus, not allow Jesus, but believe Jesus will baptize you. Would everyone stand? If you have to leave, you want to sneak on out uh, after I pray this prayer, feel free to do that. The ushers will be at each of the door with the generosity buckets for the tithe and the offering. But if you don't have to sneak out and you'd like to pray and believe with those that will be coming in a minute, just we just we just hang on. But if if you if you need if you got kids next door, you probably would want to go and get the kids out, relieve our wonderful workers there. But after I pray this prayer, I'm going to ask those of you that are hungry, that are just seeking, that are honest, would come down and one of our pastors will lay hands on you and pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your spirit. Lord, we don't want to just do church, but we want to be a church filled with your spirit and power and anointing. So today, Lord, those that will come Give us a believing, open heart. And Lord, whether you choose to fill us with our prayer language while we're standing here, whether you choose to just give us a feeling of power or no feeling at all, and then later in our personal prayer time, you, you do something. I, I don't know, Lord, who am I? Who am I to tell you what to do? I'm just hungry. And I'm just begging you to fill the people in the Father's house with the prayer language because we've got so much to do with our families and our community and in this world but we can't do it by ourselves in your name